In Pit Lane is proudly brought to you by Dino Tech by Dino Dynamics. For your nearest workshop, visit our website. And with the support of the Ramada Resort, Phillip Island. The Australian Auto Aftermarket Expo is the largest event of its kind down under. A showcase for the local aftermarket industry, the Expo is the closest thing that Australia has to the famous SEMA show in Las Vegas or the performance racing industry show in Indianapolis. The Australian Auto Aftermarket Expo was the largest display of vehicle repair and servicing equipment, replacement parts, tools and accessories ever held in Australia. The Expo was opened by visiting members of the Senate Inquiry into the Australian automotive industry. A positive move for the sector, according to Australian Automotive Aftermarket Association Executive Director, Stuart Charity. Well, we're certainly flavour of the month at the moment with the politicians. Um, look, the, uh, the car industry is shutting down, unfortunately. I think we talked about that two years ago and we said that was going to be a likelihood. That's now the reality. What we're saying to the politicians is the aftermarket is alive and well. Have a look around this show. Um, this industry has uh, got enormous scope uh, to grow uh, with the right government uh, policy intervention and we can um, pick up some of the slack and, and, and some of the capacity and, and, and employ some of the great people that are, that are going to be losing their jobs when the car industry shut down. Do you think you've had a good hearing? Do you think they understand the, the impact that this industry has on the Australian economy and can have in the future? Look, certainly we had uh, the Senate, uh, the federal senators and, and crossbenchers um, uh, here this morning and, and they get it. We also had the Victorian Industry Minister um, speak at our breakfast this morning. She gets it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Ian McFarlane, the federal industry minister, uh, doesn't seem to be getting it at the moment. Um, his solution to the industry shutdown is to pull all the funding out and uh, move on and uh, we think that's going to be a very, very bad idea. The Minister himself uh, was one of the few politicians that wasn't here today. I mean, is that sort of indicative of uh, where the government, the current government sees this industry? Well, I've said this a couple of times. It's really disappointing that, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, Minister McFarlane uh, believes that when the car industry shut down, the whole industry is going to shut down, and, and in his head he's already moved on. Um, we're still going to be here. Most of our manufacturers don't even supply the car industry. Uh, we, we're great at four-wheel drive components. We're great at high performance and motorsport. Uh, we're great at replacement parts, um, workshop tools and equipment, uh, and none of that is sold to the, the three local car manufacturers. So um, we're making automotive parts. We've got an industry that's not at capacity and can be. Uh, we just need some, some vision from the federal government and uh, we can help make it happen. So what have you been telling them? What specifically are you looking for from government? Okay, so we want uh, to do a couple of things. One, the first thing is a study into the, uh, uh, the non-passenger vehicle automotive manufacturing in this country, not just aftermarket, we're talking truck, we're talking bus, we're talking recreational vehicles and so on. Uh, so let's find out how big the industry is and what its scope to, uh, to grow is. Um, the automotive transition scheme at the moment is only for the car companies and their direct supplier base. That's significantly undersubscribed. So let's widen the criteria um, and, and let's uh, use that money to help stimulate new innovation and, and so on. Um, and we've put a couple of uh, what we believe are, are, are very innovative and, and visionary projects. Uh, one is around um, uh, a motorsport cluster similar to Silverstone in the UK where uh, uh, we can make Australia a centre of excellence in the southern hemisphere for motorsport uh, component companies, put it around a racetrack. Um, and the final thing is an aftermarket lab which is uh, uh, based on our friends in the US, SEMA. They've got a SEMA garage concept where it's got all the test equipment, it's got all the uh, rapid prototyping and so on. So um, companies can take uh, a product from concept through to uh, development all under one roof. You mentioned the motorsport precinct and the uh, and development. I think they call it the, the, the carbon fibre triangle in, uh, in the, you know, over in England. Uh, any idea of where that might be? Has there been any discussion about where that might be centred? 
Look, we've just uh, put the proposal out there. We haven't done any feasibility and what have you. There's obviously a, a number of um, uh, precincts um, or New South Wales and Victoria and in South Australia for that matter that have been um, uh, talked about as, as potential sites. Um, we'd like to see this potentially being a collaborative project between a, the federal government and our state government. Uh, we think it all needs to be under one roof. Uh, it doesn't need to be in any particular location. I think it needs to be near a track uh, to get that clustering. Also, the track lends itself to, to dynamic testing and so on. So it makes sense. But no, look, no location yet. We're, we are early days. Well, that's a very exciting project, uh, potentially for all of us. Uh, just about the show in general this year, uh, certainly it looks like a, a, a full house. I mean, uh, are you obviously delighted about the turnout this year? We are. Look, you know, with the storm clouds over the uh, over the automotive industry more generally, we, we were a little bit concerned that it might have an impact on our show, but... Um, this show is actually bigger than the, the, the 2013 show in Sydney. We've got 420 exhibitors. Every single square inch of floor space has been sold out. Um, and we're expecting uh, anything up to 12,000 trade visitors over the next three days. So we couldn't be happier. I think this is a real statement of uh, uh, the underlying strength and resilience of our industry. To be able to put a trade show of this quality and this scale on in this environment, I think is a really positive sign for our industry moving forward. One of the politicians lurking at the expo was Australian motoring enthusiast party senator Ricky Muir, who was certainly in his element at the show. Well, we're here at the Australian Automotive Aftermarket Expo and joining us is from the Motoring Enthusiast Party, is Senator Ricky Muir. And uh, Ricky, what are you doing here this, uh, this today? Here? Oh, I think I'm doing what any uh, good motor enthusiast should be doing and I'm actually enjoying a lot of the local talent which, we, uh, which is on show today. You'd be well and truly in your environment here, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I really am. This isn't really like work. This is actually something I would do in my own personal time and it's, it's just absolutely fantastic to be here. Do you think you've come here with uh, Senator Kim Carr and you're with the Senate uh, inquiry into the Australian automotive industry? Do you think that the uh, that your colleagues in Canberra have any idea at all of the potential that this area could have for the Australian economy? Look, that's actually a really good question. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if many people that are currently sitting in Canberra do have an idea of how much potential there is for the um, for Australian businesses in the aftermarket industry. And uh, I think that's something that but through the Senate inquiry and also just my background in the Motoring Enthusiast Party um, is something that we'd definitely like to um, bring a lot more light to. It has to be said that when you were elected, it was, it was quite a surprise to all of us. At what point during that fateful night did you suddenly realise, oh my God, this is actually going to happen? Oh, I think I got a phone call around about 11, 11.30 at night. Uh, I had been outside sitting by a fire uh, and thinking in 2016 I'll be doing this again. <laughs> and uh, uh, by about 11, 11.30 that night I got a phone call, it looks like we won a seat, it looks like it's in Victoria, it looks like it's you. Uh, so it was about that point, my whole life just got absolutely turned upside down, but for the better. I have the opportunity to represent motor enthusiasts and support the industry, the aftermarket industry in Australia, and it really, it, it's such an honour. It was an interesting reception you got from both the media and from your colleagues. I mean, do you think, uh, do you think that says something about the state of Australian politics when, you know, sort of average people like yourself and, you know, doing sense people like Jackie Lambie and all, they get, they get into, into Parliament supposedly to represent, you know, us the people and it seems to be, uh, it seems to be a, quite a shock to the system, to the old school. It is. It's a, it's a major shock to the system. I think there's certain aspects of the media which thought, what is going on here? And, and of course, a lot of the public as well. Uh, but the reality is, 25% thereabouts of the population were voting elsewhere. So it means something something is going on. And it's not that the system's broken. It's that people are voting elsewhere rather than just with the major parties. So it is a very interesting time in Australian politics, and I'm very happy to be part of it. What do you think that the uh, the impact of a show like this will be on the uh, on the inquiry? We've had you've had members, other members, Nick Xenophon and those coming around having a look today. What do you, what do you think that they're going to uh, get out of this? What feedback are you getting to, the, to re their reaction to all of this? I'll, I'll have to catch up with people at the end of the day, but so far that um, you know, walking around Senator, Senator Xenophon and Senator Carr, both of them already have a strong interest in the automotive sector, and they're very passionate about it. Just like myself, also Senator Madigan, that there is uh, a lot of people who have interest that they're following the committee uh, or the inquiry, uh, and they really want to do the very best they can. Uh, this, as far as what this show is going to do for politics today, hopefully, there's a fair bit of media around, it and it really highlights the important and how big it is, because it is an industry that is already successful, but there is plenty more room to grow, and we as politicians need to do everything we can to help this sector grow, especially with the demise of uh, manufacturing, uh, vehicle manufacturing here in Australia. 
Senator Muir had the chance to catch up with one of the country's most popular racing drivers in Craig Lowndes. Lowndes spent some time with the Senator who was very keen to get behind the wheel of the Formula One simulator for some laps at Albert Park. Lowndes was on hand to support his longtime sponsor ZF. Uh, ZF have uh, been a big supporter of uh, not only myself but for the team and it's been great to have an association with a, with a brand like Sax. Um, you know, very important obviously for us in the, in, the, in the race car with the suspension. We use their shock absorbers and their clutches. Um, but of course uh, ZF as a company do far more than just race car stuff. They do a lot of road cars, uh, transmissions uh, for buses and trucks, boats, everything else. So it's, uh, it's great to be here. You had an association with the company for quite some years. How important is it for a driver to have these sort of these personal relationships rather than just what's with the team? Oh, look, it's always really important. I think that uh, you know to have an, a close association, and, and really, as I said, it's obviously close to our heart because of the racing side of it. But then when you actually delve into the actual business and, and the uh, the company itself and understand exactly how diverse they are and what they do and how they go about their business, um, and really, look for me, it, it's really been a, a great uh, you know partnership with Sachs or ZF and uh, to come here to the stands and the conference it's really nice to meet so many people especially this industry very close to home for me I'm a qualified motor mechanic so understanding all this side of it and seeing what's around here um, but it's great to be on the stand and uh, you know sharing some um, information and obviously some stories about my life growing up and and what we're doing. You've had an interesting start to the season in the V8 supercar ranks. Um, you've also re-signed for another year with uh, with Triple Eight, I believe. Uh, but also, we've seen uh, Shane Van Gisbergen, who'll also be at this particular uh, this particular show tomorrow, has signed with the team for next year. How do you think that dynamic will work with the three of you, with yourself, Jamie, and now Shane? Oh, I think it'll be great. I think there's no doubt that the team are wanting to expand. Having Shane come on board, he's a young. We know he's fast. Um, you know, to get him into the uh, you know into the umbrella of of uh, Red Bull Racing Australia, which has been fantastic, and uh, yeah, again we expand in engineering. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously expand with the data knowledge and everything else, like most other teams have done. HRT, FPR are doing it. Uh, so for us as a team, it's probably a normal transition. But uh, you know, it's going to be tough to get everything all aligned. You know, as I said, we got to have to bring in another car, another engineer, another crew. Um, you know, have two transporters transporting the cars around. So it is, um, you know, a, a, a big growth for the team. But it's its growth that I think the team can sustain, uh, and really looking forward to uh, you know spending yeah another couple of years with the team and uh, hopefully getting some more victories. Apart from your VA supercar racing, we're also going to see you back at the Spa 24 Hour. We also were hoping to see you at Le Mans this year. I believe that fell through. What happened there? Uh, yeah, just to, sort of just didn't come off this year. I think that uh, you know every year, the start of every year, we obviously got to be very mindful of uh, what the V8 calendar looks like and if we can get an opportunity and make sure the doors open, which it is this year. But we just didn't quite get the uh, um, the invite or, the, or I suppose uh, an opportunity to, to be at Le Mans. Um, so look, we'll look for it next year. But to go back to Spa again this year is something that I was really keen um, having a great opportunity last year uh, we drove with AF Corsa in the Ferrari um, you know Steve White who owned the car you know it was um, I was lucky enough to get an invite through him to get over there and experience a 24-hour which is I haven't experienced before 12 hour of Bathurst is the only thing I've ever done so to go through that period was really good but this year we go back as an Australian team with a Lamborghini Roger Largo uh, and uh, the guys that uh, ran there last year is uh, you know it's good to go back he's gonna have a brand new car and I'm really excited now having 12 months of experience or being over there 12 months ago um, has given me great experience and knowledge going back again this year. A lot of people make the comparison between Spa and Bathurst. I mean, you've had lots of experience at Bathurst. From your point of view, what is the similarity? Oh, look, I think there's no doubt that, uh, you know, the characteristics of uh, coming out of uh, Turn 1, going down through Rouge and end up Camel Strait, very similar to a, a lot of uh, aspects of Bathurst. You know, the elevation change is huge. High speed is incredibly, uh, you know, fast, especially down around the back section where, like a GT car, you're almost flat nearly everywhere around the back section. Um, but it's just that flowing feeling, nature, um, going through the forestry down around the back, you know, it, very similar feel that we get as Bathurst. Um, as I said, the elevation change is quite remarkable. And, uh, you know, Bathurst do 12 hours go to spa do 24 hours i think it's uh, you know again it'll be a uh, be an eye opener of course this year you didn't do the bathurst 12 hour like all of the va guys i mean looking back at it i mean how upset were all you guys about having to miss that uh, that race oh look you know the 12 hour you know is, is is great opportunity for all the race drivers to be you know be part of it is our local track in a sense you know we understand it very well so we have a great opportunity to do well against the european teams and drivers so, look, it was disappointing. It was the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Um, you know, again, we'll sit down and wait to see what the calendar brings out for next year. But uh, I know there's a lot of drivers out there, especially in V8 world, that'd like to get the opportunity to go back for the 12-hour next year if the date becomes free and available.
What about the rise of GT racing around the world? I mean, is this something you're looking at long term? I mean, you know, we're not trying to retire you not before your time, but I mean, are you looking at the end game now? Are you looking at the point of uh, perhaps uh, just winding back eventually from V8s and perhaps doing some of these bucket list events? Oh, look, I've always had the bucket list events on, on my uh, radar. It's just a matter of having the opportunities to do them. So to go back to Spa last year was uh, was one of them. Le Mans is definitely another one I'd like to do. But yeah, around the world, GT cars are, and the category are, are definitely growing. And, uh, you know, we see it here in Australia. Uh, the cars are nice to drive. They're very different to drive than a VA supercar. But VA supercar is where, I, you know, that, that's my uh, you know primary uh, you know, job role or, or uh, you know, industry that I love being involved in. It you know it takes me all around around the world anyway. The V8 car is uh, very hard and very difficult to drive in the sense it doesn't have ABS, it doesn't have traction control. We have more horsepower to play with with a smaller tyre. So tyre longevity is always a big key part of it. So, uh, you know, there's different aspects of uh, different racing, but, uh, you know, for me, I I'm just really enjoying both sides of it. 99 wins, how important is the 100? Oh, look, you know, it'd be great to get the, the tonne up. I think that uh, any cricket player says if you can get 100 runs in any cricket, uh, especially uh, whether it's a test or a uh, one day, or it's, uh, you know, it's quite a special moment for you, and uh, I think it will be the same. Apart from all the bling on the show floor, there was also action outside the exhibition centre with a fully operational Dino Tech Dino from in-pit lane supporters Dino Dynamics. Dino Dynamics CEO Alan Evans was also on hand in his role as a board member of the Performance, Racing and Tuning Council of Australia. Well, we're here with Alan Evans, the Managing Director of Dino Dynamics here at the Australian Automotive Aftermarket Expo. And Alan, could you tell us what you're exhibiting here at the Expo this week? Well, what we're doing is we're actually doing two things. We're actually showing our uh, product in the stand here, but also outside, we've actually got a real live demo doing demonstrations for anyone who comes to the show and wants to see what a dyno does and what it can do, more importantly. But we've also got some of our new products. We've got our new fuel system analyzer, we've got our new TACO, we've got our new OBD2 kit, which enables the operator to get more and more data from a car, diagnose more faults, and fix them, which is the important thing that they want to do for customers. But also, we're put a brochure out about our new Daytona model which we've designed particularly for the states where they've got these big pickup trucks with seven litre supercharged motors. It can do 325 kilometres an hour, two and a half thousand horsepower and can take a truck with a track width of a hundred inches uh, which is a pretty big track width in uh, the US. So obviously the international market is important for a company like Dino Dynamics. Um, do you think that overall, we've seen lots, lots of politicians running around here today talking about the Australian automotive industry and the future of it. Do you think that they appreciate uh, just how potentially big this, uh, this whole industry could be and how benefit, beneficial it could be for Australia? Frankly, no. I don't think they do understand that a company like ours is manufacturing in Australia exporting to the world and we don't get one dollar of government assistance and in fact when we encounter problems like we do in the states where they make life difficult for you even though there's a free trade agreement don't get much response out of government to try and overcome those hurdles uh, and of course the US is a very competitive market I know companies go to their politicians to stop companies like ours having fair competition uh, but the Australian politicians wander around, pat themselves on the back, but don't do a great deal to make sure a company like ours actually gets a fair go on companies like the States. We do a good in Asia, uh, and that's because we don't have as much competition, and the Asian market is growing for us and will be a very significant market in the future. But again, it's something if the Australian politicians don't work, watch out, they'll take our products, they'll take our ideas, and they'll build their own. You mentioned the uh, dyno you've got outside, the Dino Tech Dino. Uh, one of the things that uh, people have been looking at is the fact that you know, you've just got it basically thrown down in the car park there, it's all set up. Uh, tell us about that. I mean, you don't need to bolt it down, you just bring it in, set it up, balance it, and away you go. Uh, absolutely. Look, it's very easy. Each of our sales engineers has one in a van, and they can turn up at a workshop, have it on the ground, a car in 15 minutes, and show people what it can do. We've designed it purposely to make it flexible and mobile for workshops. Uh, so that they can put it in the workshop, they can shift it around if they like, uh, doesn't take up space when they're not using it, but very importantly, it's very easy to use, it's very easy to set up, and it's a very, very economical unit. $35,000 for a dyno in this day and age is a spectacular price. Uh, and a, a workshop can earn so much more money from using a dyno, finding faults, diagnosing those faults and fixing them, and making customers happy. Well, if people want to find out more about your products, where do they go on the web? Uh, they go www.dino.com.au and it'll tell them where we are, where our dinos are, but more importantly, 
all our new products. We're making go-kart dynos, we're making motorcycle dynos. Uh, we've made a brand new go-kart dyno for the Asian market. Now I'm sure there's a lot of Australian go-karters when they realise you can get a chassis dyno, you can take to an event, tune your kart on it and make yourself more competitive. We'll see some of the Australian go-karters buy it. Well we look forward to seeing that but for now Alan Evans, thanks for joining us once again on Impit Lane. Thanks, Brett. Love Pit Lane. Happy to sponsor it, and we uh, hope to see you more and more on uh, community uh, TV. The PRTC staged its regular Expo Networking Night with guest speaker, CAM CEO, Eugene Arocca. Well, Eugene, you uh, talked to the members of the PRTC tonight about the results of the uh, of the CAM survey. We did touch on it uh, in a past episode of In Pit Lane, but uh, in a nutshell, I mean, what did you find? Well, we found what we thought was there, which is a major economic uh, kick or power. Um, $2.7 billion of direct industry output, 16,000 employees, 155,000 participants. We got some clout. Motorsport matters. We've always suspected that, but to actually have Ernst & Young spend nearly a year doing all the surveying and all the information, bring it back to us and present it to government, has raised some eyebrows. So it's pretty good. Exciting. So what sort of response have you had from government so far? I mean, has this surprised them or have they, uh, have they looked at it and they still don't care anyway? Oh no, they're starting to get a, they're starting to get a feel for it. We took um, Jamie Wincup to Parliament House in uh, December and announced it and uh, they certainly raised their eyebrows and what we've been doing since then is being one-on-ones with selected members of Parliament, Senators and MPs, Federal and State. It's opened up the doors. It's actually opened up the doors for motorsport at various levels, including councils, where they're starting to say, well, how can we make this happen? You know, wh how about other tracks? Where do we need to spend the money? You know, how can we support Daniel? What are you doing for junior participation? So I think it's been a wonderful opportunity and a tool for us to open those doors that previously were not quite closed, but weren't exactly open. You mentioned the tracks. The situation with tracks is interesting. We've seen over the past sort of couple of decades uh, the closure of many tracks and the opening of virtually none at all. Uh, if we keep going like that, we're going to run out of tracks fairly soon. How can we how can we actually develop tracks and uh, what sort of tracks are we going to develop too? Because certainly every time people seem to talk about tracks, they're talking about something that could possibly run sort of a Grand Prix, and that's surely not what we need, is it? No. Look, um, that is the biggest challenge for our industry. Our membership numbers are growing, our events are growing, our permitted sanction events are all growing, our officials are growing, we don't have a home for them to go and compete and to go and officiate. We're telling government if you don't continue, or if you don't start to support councils in getting even rudimentary tracks, basic tracks, Ballarat, they're interested in helping out the 12 or 13 clubs in Ballarat, but we are saying to them, build something basic, but have the master plan that incorporates a national track, because we believe, sadly, there's a couple of tracks in Victoria that ain't going to be there in about three or five years. We need to replace that track, and it's a three to five year journey. So you're right, we're losing more than we're getting, but we do need to build tracks basic with the opportunity to build up if we can continue to sell the story about the power of motorsport. We spoke to Stuart Charity and he mentioned the possibility of a, of a motorsport precinct uh, and a high performance precinct as they have in Europe, what I suppose we call it the, uh, the carbon fibre triangle in, uh, around Silverstone. Um, this is obviously something you're looking at in your show tonight, the CAM Centre of Excellence. How far are you along the path to getting that up and running? Oh, look, I'd be a fool if, I'd be a fool if I said um, it's around the corner. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of lobbying, a lot of government interaction, but um, this country's got a particularly strong and long history in motorsport, as you know, you'd know better than I would, and I just think that for a country that produced an F1 champion, or the equivalent of an F1 champion in 1960s, and hasn't done anything since in terms of um, being involved in the industry as a manufacturer or builder of cars, it's a, it's a shame. And so, is it possible? Absolutely. Is it, gonna, is it gonna happen in the next three to five years? No, but we have to talk it up. The more you talk it up, the more the opportunity the government will start to say, well, we've got a couple of hundred million dollars we want to invest in a local region. Let's see if we can make it happen. And so I've put it out there because I do believe it's possible. And the big driver will be at the Asia Pacific. If we built a motorsport park that we felt was just good for Victoria, we're kidding ourselves. We're going to build something that is actually interactive with the rest of the Asia Pacific area. And I think that will be the major attraction for any government, federal or state, to have that opportunity at their doorstep.
you mentioned uh, the possibility of one day an Australian building a Formula One yet again, but uh, what about uh, at, the, at those lower levels, I mean, in terms of encouraging people, was it uh, ever raised about the possibility of Australia building its own car for something like Formula Four, which could be used around the Asia-Pacific region? It's one of my great disappointments, I should say, that we've had to deal with Formula 4 and overseas com companies. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get a chassis built in Australia by an Australian company? The technology ain't that hard. Like, I'm sure that we have got companies in this, in, uh, in this country that could quite readily get FIA approval to build the necessary chassis or the engine. So, somewhat disappointing that we had to buy them from overseas, that they get engines from overseas to ship them in. That costs money, which we're going to recover in the long run, but it's, a, it's almost... It's almost a snapshot of where we are, but we weren't able to produce our own Formula 4 cars when the FIA has been talking about this for two to four years. So it's a very good comment and I support you entirely. We'd love to think the next iteration of F4 cars are going to be Australian made. So why didn't that happen? I mean, did you, did you contact local uh, constructors, people like Spectrum and the, the like, and, and talk to them? Because we have seen in Formula SAE, which is uh, an area that we've been involved in, a lot of very advanced uh, chassis construction with, uh, with carbon fibre and uh, that could be used. I think um, the, the answer to that is no. Um, reality is that these companies would have been and should have been aware of the F4 opportunity and most of them probably didn't seize the opportunity. We still have residual pushback on Formula Ford. So a lot of the people who could be building Formula 4s are building Formula Fords. There's going to have to be a point in time when, hopefully, they'll start to say, we will put our hands up for Formula 4 and we will go and speak to the FAA, we will go and get a tick and we'll go and support the Australian industry. So the answer to your question is, we didn't think there was an appetite and there probably still isn't an appetite, but crikey, I'd be disappointed if we couldn't get an F4 up before we got an F1 up. The Performance Racing and Tuning Council also announced the results of its industry survey into the economic impact of motorsport on the local aftermarket and tuning industry. We have 221 members of the PRTC. Uh, we actually surveyed those guys or those businesses and what was quite interesting to us was that the vast majority have under five employees. Uh, you know, the other thing too is we, we have the other part of the spectrum where we have 50 plus employees just looking after the motorsport side of things. In terms of sales, we can have some businesses turning over $50 million plus and the best part about this particular survey found that we export to some of the low cost countries in the world which really does go to show that ingenuity in Australia is alive and well. Of course as you said we're now in moving more into the Asian market and I mean we've covered uh, races as far away as Inner Mongolia I mean we've, where we've attended a place like Ordos and, uh, and then closer to home at Macau and Malaysia and we see it growing and the potential there is enormous. Do you think that the both the industry and the government understand the incredible potential that we have in our own region? Oh, I, think, I think the industry does. Um, I think increasingly the government is starting to come on board with it. You know there is some money that's uh, being uh, shelved at the moment for the uh, for the automotive transition fund, and we're certainly hopeful to unlock some of that, uh, not for the AAA, but more importantly for the businesses to ensure that they have a future. So, what about the uh, companies joining the uh, the PRTC? I mean, what's the role that you play in the in the industry? Ah, uh, so what we do is we actually uh, convene and we make sure that. Uh, all issues that are raised, and we raised another one, of course, this evening, uh, was, we, we bring it to a, a, a constitution to make sure that we can uh, bring the issues to a fore and, uh, and try and solve many of the issues. Of course, we're not, we're not God. We don't, we don't quite perceive that at any stretch of the imagination, but we do try and uh, bring all of the uh, issues to the table and rectify them as best we can. The other issue you did touch on tonight was uh, regarding suspension and cars with electronic stability control. Um, where do we stand on that at the moment? It's been a, a big issue over the past few years. Yes, yeah, so the AAA and uh, many of its partners spent uh, just over a quarter of a million dollars just recently testing six vehicles in the United States in California. Uh, we have uh, we passed all those tests, I'm pleased to say. So we actually ra we checked uh, raised vehicles as well as lowered vehicles. And so we're now formulating that information, sending it to federal regulators, and we have uh, an understanding that federal regulators will remove the stipulation from the National Code of Practice. Well, that's good news for, uh, for everybody, for the industry and also for the enthusiasts. Uh, best of luck with it, but for now, Rob, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Uh, thank you. The US-based SEMA show in Las Vegas is the granddaddy of all aftermarket expos. SEMA is the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association of the United States, and they were represented at the AAA Expo by Linda Spencer.
I get a great job this week to just come and uh, I haven't been in Australia in 15 years and so I just wanted to come and be able to see how the market's developing and also uh, Australians make that huge effort that 30 hour trip to the States and so I just wanted to come and uh, be able to network here as well. We've heard and we've seen on our show a number of for a number of years the PRI show is, is very well known here. Our Francique has done an awful lot of work in promoting it. We're all aware of SEMA, it's a very famous show. But for people who aren't aware of what the what the show's about, um, in a nutshell, what is it? Yeah. Uh, the SEMA show is really a the fashion. A fashion uh, institution for cars. Everything about vehicles, um, the latest, the greatest for vehicles, and it's an international show. Only trade, 130,000 people from uh, every country in the world, including Australia. So if Australian companies are looking to get involved, I mean, how do they get involved and how do they, uh, is there room there for them? I mean, are you hoping to have more Australian exhibitors there? Yeah. So, yeah, Australians can come for two, in two ways. One would be as an exhibitor, and yep, now is the time if companies are interested to um, sign up for a booth now. And, of course, also as a visitor. So both, um, they're welcome to come both as an exhibitor and as an attendee. One of the things I suppose SEMA, the show, is a very public face of the organisation, but SEMA does an awful lot of work behind the scenes in terms of lobbying government. We've probably heard tonight from CAMS uh, that it's been a very difficult job getting that sort of thing done in Australia. What about in the United States? SEMA has had quite a bit of success. What advice would you give the equivalents here in Australia? Yeah. Well, I've seen great um, strides here in Australia with the AAA going and, and really working with the government and doing exactly what they have been doing, which is um, ongoing. Uh, you really need to be educating uh, legislators. Uh, they can't necessarily know about your industry, gathering statistics on why it's important to the economy, to jobs, and then really working with them on technical advice, how to make the best laws. You know, SEMA has been around for over 50 years, and it's really hard for them to come up with a concern that we haven't dealt with already. So what we do is have off-the-shelf solutions. They bring up an issue, and we can work with them on how to address their issue in the least restrictive way. So what is the environment over in the United States at the moment? We've got, uh, with environmental issues, road safety issues and all that, uh, as far as the enthusiast market goes, is this something, we're, are we holding our own? Are we continuing? Or does the future look bright? In the U.S.? Or? Yeah. So in the U.S., um, the economy is really picking up and it'll be really reflected. You'll see each year um, that the SEMA show is, is getting bigger and it's not bigger in the sense of numbers, but in just the, the enthusiasm that's building. And it's because the market is really um, coming back and growing. And uh, for the industry, um, you're, we're really working as you are here to get young people involved in the industry because that's the future. And so when you can really rope them in, we do things like the uh, builder, the engine builder contest, other things to attract uh, young people to come in the industry. And it takes a lot of the veterans in the industry to work with these young people, teach them how to work on engines and do it in a, a safe way. So if people want any more information on the SEMA show and SEMA in general, where do they go on the web? That's a good question. Uh, at SEMAshow.com and for anything international, SEMA.org slash international. Well, it's certainly on the bucket list of a lot of us, myself included, and hopefully we'll see you over there very soon. But for now, Linda, a safe trip back to the United States and thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Thanks so much for giving me the chance to talk with you. Thanks. The Expo shared floor space with the Australian Collision Repair Expo, a showcase of paint, panel and crash repair equipment and skills. A special guest for this year's show was US custom car legend and host of the popular TV show Overhaul and Chip Foose. One of the stars here at the Australian Automotive Aftermarket Expo is, Austra is American custom car legend Chip Foose and also the host of the popular program Overhauling. And uh, Chip, welcome to, uh, welcome to the Tri AAA Expo. Tell Thank us, uh, what are you doing here for the weekend? Who are you here for? Well, I'm here with 3M and uh, we've actually been going around to, to some of the different shops and uh, visiting with people that use 3M products. And uh, I give a little speech. I talk about how my, you know, how my career got started and the fact that I started using 3M products over 40 years ago when I started in my father's shop 
and the innovation technology and the advancements that 3M makes with their with their products. You know, they make the best product in the world, but the fact that they continue to make it better and better and better is what allows us to get better and better and better. Because I've always said, if you want to do your best, use the best. So I'm lucky and I feel blessed that I get to be here with 3M, get to meet all these great people and say hello and sign an autograph for them. But uh, it's been a wonderful show and first time to Melbourne and I hope I get to come back sometime. I want to bring the family and actually uh, maybe go tour and visit some more of Australia. Of course, there are sort of classic modes in, in custom cars around the world, but it also happens to be sort of subject to trends and fashions. What's the latest coming out of the United States now? What are the trends that we're seeing over there? Well, it's funny you ask me that because if there's a trend that I see, I will turn and run 180 degrees from it. I never want to do anything that's trendy. I want to focus on good design because it's so expensive to build a car like the cars that we build that I don't want a customer to three or four years from now think they need to upgrade their car and, and do something different because it's starting to look old. If you do good design 20 or 30 years from now, that car is still beautiful and that's what I try to focus on. We've got a problem here in Australia with the modified car scene. I think it was similar some states in the United States as well where it's becoming increasingly difficult to modify the car because of government regulations, environmental protection, that sort of thing. Uh, as custom car enthusiasts, I mean, what can we do uh, in order to uh, keep our, our passion for these sorts of individual cars going? Well, I think that will be determined by the aftermarket and the industry and the people that own these companies that are building parts. They're going to find out what they need to do to stay up on it and to work with the manufacturers so that they can continue to allow cars to be personalized. Well, you've got a whole lot of people waiting to get your autograph now, but thanks for giving us some time and enjoy your short time in Australia. We'll hopefully we'll see you back. But for now, Chip Foose, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Thank you, Brett. Pleasure to see you. After a few tough years where the local industry has lost not one, not two, but three major auto manufacturers, you'd almost be expecting an air of doom and gloom at the Expo. However, the feeling of optimism that filled this year's expo was palpable. Sadly, this enthusiasm does not seem to be shared by the current Australian government, who seem quite content to just sit back and let the industry wither and die. Hopefully the energy and optimism clearly evident in this year's expo may be able to change their minds. More power, better fuel economy, a cleaner, more efficient engine. They're just a few of the advantages of having your car tuned on a Dynotech Dyno. To find your nearest Dynotech workshop, go to dyno.com.au. Dynotech by Dyno Dynamics.